Hello everyone. Welcome to Tea with TPS. This is in fact a re recording of episode number 31, which was premiered last Sunday. Since there were some technical problems, Sri K. J. Kumar IAS has agreed to redo it again very graciously. So that is what we are going to do. But before that, I must say for the confidence of everyone who use technology, I must give you some of my experiences with technology very briefly. You may think that the technology will be best in IIT or uh, in, um, in uh, MIT, sorry, not IIT, Massachusetts Technology and also NASA. I'm sure we'll all swear by technology there. But my experience was when I went to MIT with uh, Ambassador Narayanan, everything was fine till Mr. Narayanan got up to speak and the mic failed. But Mr. Narayanan had a good one on that. He said, if this happened in my village in Uravur, you would say it is third world technology. Since this is MIT, I must say it's only a systemic failure, he said. <laughs> Everybody laughed. And the next experience I had was NASA. I went to say goodbye to Kalpana Chawla on her space journey, not the final space journey before that. And uh, I was told that I could speak to her just before she got launched. And so the NASA administrator came to a conference room and said, now you can speak to Kalpana. So I kept saying, hello Kalpana, hello Kalpana, nothing happened. The administrator was very upset. He went to his room and checked and the line was fine. So he came back and still there was no Kalpana on my line. Then the scientist from my embassy, who is quick with these things, what he did was he looked under the table because this was a huge conference table on which one mic was in the center. And the, the cleaner perhaps that evening had pulled off the mic or the wire from the mic. So, so such things can happen anywhere, anytime. So we should not be ashamed of our own technology. There is nothing called perfect technology and that is for the consolation. So but let me welcome Mr. Jay Kumar once again. And let me repeat what I said about him yesterday. I said, when I think about him, I remember the words of Wordsworth about Coleridge. There is nothing he has not touched and he did not leave anything he touched unembellished. And that is what you feel when you look at his experience. He joined the civil service, did extremely well and became the chief secretary, the highest position in Kerala state. Then he became the vice chancellor of the Tunja Tirtachan University. He was the founder of that and made, a, made it an excellent institution before he left. He is a writer and he has done 44 books in Malayalam and English. And as a poet, he has 400 poems in different anthologies. And most interesting of all, he is a lyricist and his lyrics have gone into about 100 movies. And a later interest he had in paintings, he had 15 individual painting exhibitions. Then he has had awards from India and abroad. I myself had the pleasure of presiding over the presentation of the Sri Chitra Tirunal Award for him last year. And then on talks, he has been talking basically about Mahatma Gandhi and Malayalam all around the world. So that way, he's a multi-talented personality as you all know. So the first question I asked him yesterday, which I'll ask him again, is that of all these pursuits, which one did you enjoy most? Yes, Mr. Deco. All our life, there are certain core attractions as well as peripheral attractions. I would say civil service was for me a peripheral attraction. Attraction, no doubt, but it was a peripheral attraction. The core attraction of my life, or rather the core gravitas of my life, if I may say so, was to become a writer. Uh, that is how I identified myself. At the end of the day, I should be remembered as a writer. Do for a living is a separate thing. It's a matter of option. It's a matter of choice. I could yeah. be a lecturer. I could be a, a, a journalist. I could be a lawyer or whatever. But then, uh, of course, I also did a course in journalism, thinking that if civil service doesn't work, I'll join a newspaper. Again, uh, I could write. So uh, civil service was a very wonderful option. I was very happy if I would have I, I could get it. 
but even if i don't get it i would have ended up as a writer but they but my life turned out in such a way that i got into the service and i gave my full to the service at the same time uh, it was the struggle to keep the uh, the writer in me alive without getting compromised by the pressures of work and the trappings of power that civil service gives you i think when i look back my greatest achievement in life seems to be not that i got into the civil service or i became a writer the greatest achievement seems to be to have pursued the career of a writer in spite of being in the civil service so well they say they say about pandit nehru that if he had not joined politics he would have won a nobel prize for literature so that could apply to you because it was a distraction for you too it was a distraction but i would say that in spite of the fact that i continued for 35 years in service and and working there after also even now i am working i somehow developed a, a kind of balancing trick by which i could uh, sort of ride two cycles at the same time like a, like a circus fellow so what, how was your how was your life in the civil service itself obviously you had great success you reached all the levels that any or any ias officer could reach so obviously you had a happy experience but there must have been difficult moments in your career also are there sure, many sure sir i think mean, civil, civil service as you know is not a bed of roses it is not an easy drive ride for anyone but uh, i should appreciate i should uh, looking back i i feel happy that i did not get into major controversies in any case and uh, i came out rather unscathed at the same time i was not if i may so say so without being boastful i did not leave, lead a career which is colorless and orderless it was quite colorful and orderful yes. <laughs> i did not shy away from decision making i did uh, i did take uh, decisions but uh, i think it is in my character not to sort of cross swords with people or to precipitate a situation at the same time don't compromise i never compromised on my principles or ethics but i sort of skirt around or ensure that i don't get into this kind of immoral things or incorrect things at the same time i should also protect my minister so i have i have used to get them done yeah i have uh, used lot of strategies uh, to survive fairly well in the service <laughs> no some of these youngsters who come to my class to prepare for civil service the ias aspirants often ask me this question how do we overcome this problem of uh, political interference and the minister becoming uh, corrupt and so you are forced to get yourself corrupted and so dr babu paul had the answer he said as long as you believe that the chair you are sitting in is not bigger than you there is no problem <laughs> that's what he used to say yeah, of course that answer is correct uh, in a way but uh, this said this, this is a very standard it's a stereotype perception that young aspirants into the civil service normally they hold this this kind of perception saying that you are the uh, sort of crusader of truth and you have the villainous minister the politician trying to be corrupt all the time and pulling you down it's a kind of archetype which i think most of the films must have uh, uh, also helped in uh, sort of driving down this archetype the 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 <laughs> the man the shining armor that kind of knight in shining armor the worst is the villainous politician i always say there is nothing like that don't underestimate your politicians nor uh, should be sort of paint them with one brush all black all dark nothing like that right? politician have has their own uh, politicians have their own ideas and their own norms and their own choices priorities you have your very clear priorities um, when when, the, when there is a conflict of interest you know what position you take and as long as your reputation is good enough and sound enough the minister knows how to side track you and get his things done whether it is correct or wrong it is his interest he is if he has to get something done politically he will do it the only thing is you should not unnecessarily fall into the crossfire so i have escaped that crossfire without being a, without betraying my minister so most of the times sir i used to tell my my piece saying that sir what you are trying to do is not correct this is the right thing to do but if you decide otherwise i will not say more than this but it is not correct so he'll say you leave the file here we will discuss no but from the point of view of the time when you joined and today has there been a deterioration in the civil service in terms of you know corruption and uh, other activities which are coming out is it because they are being reported 
was it always there but we used to look at the civil service as incorruptible at one time but now it is the opposite most people expect that civil servants are corrupt or they are in league with the ministers etc is it a reality so the citadel of being an unassailable moral <laughs> moral construct that is over i suppose nobody looks at civil service as a totally incorruptible edifice anymore but at the same time i don't think everything is lost even in earlier times also there were people who were clever enough and had their own uh, axe to grind and you know they had their greasy palms and all that but then the percentage is small it is a fraction it is a fraction slowly it is increasing uh, uh, larger number of people are becoming sort of pliable they are becoming pliable i will not say outright corrupt but people are becoming pliable what you generally call in bureaucratic circles is anticipatory compliance they think that this is what my minister wants therefore he is more than ready to oblige it oblige him and therefore uh, there is there might be a price for obliging the minister we don't know so that percentage is increasing but i don't think that everything is lost i don't think the sense of idealism is lost in bureaucracy although the sheen of the idealism is coming down people are becoming more and more pragmatic and when i see very pragmatic people right at the stage of their uh, assistant collector shape i really get scared if they are they become so pragmatic even in the initial days they will become very <laughs> dangerously pragmatic as they go up you know you are <laughs> pragmatic but then you don't have to be dangerously pragmatic because you have to retain that kind of idealism throughout your career and i don't think sir at least in kerala things are not that bad in kerala you can still uh, hold your uh, you know your your morality your political morality your bureaucratic morality and say that sir this far and not beyond the ministers also understand he can sponsor the education travels but do the youngsters hanker after publicity isn't that a problem of the young stage when they have so much power and so much visibility so each one trying to get the columns is that a problem also because you, an- anonymity of the civil service was supposed to be sacrosanct it is all down sir because i think uh, we should divide the generation into pre computer days and post computer days or pre internet days and post internet days sir we belong to the pre internet days so we had been anonymous civil servants there was some beauty in or some charm in being an anonymous civil servant at the same time we also slowly came into the limelight because there was a media but the post internet age uh, uh, officers they find that this medium is a very very the tempting very tempting medium but most of the time you know the temptation overtake instead of doing hardcore work they only try to tell that i have been a great guy you know <laughs> that also is there in fact there in the img which i am heading now i have introduced a, a sort of component saying that how to deal with the, uh, the social media the challenges of dealing with social media is something which i think we should be telling the youngsters social media is a kind of two edged weapon it can be used in both ways but most of the time it is used to sort of self propagating uh, or propagating the self image i think that is a trap it's a trap people have fallen into the trap and they also come to grief because the truth is some of the good work they are doing is also coming to limelight because some of our young collectors and so on they are so good in their work look at the corona for situation example, for example when we had the flood situation in kerala many collectors used technology very creatively very yes. creatively to mobilize a lot of support youngsters came for their rescue i think they they are very tech savvy also and they know how to utilize the only thing is it has to be moderated it has to be moderate that is what we are trying to tell them in the during the training course that don't shy away from social media or technology but use it for a public purpose your glow will come naturally you know you don't have to uh, make you glow yourself the glow will come naturally when you do good things so use the technology for that that is that is my take on that all right in the civil service of course you had a wide experience which you may not get in your other walks of life has that enriched your uh, ability to write more bring in as i say as they say there is every file is a life so you have must have dealt with many many lives some you may have saved some you may not have been able to help so that kind of complexity for a civil servant gives a separate perspective on writing like malayatu ramakrishnan for example so is it the way that you have absorbed them sir i am basically a poet i am not a novelist so malayatu's case is because a novelist comes across a lot of life situations for me with my sensitivity as a poet sir i have uh, i always say that 
the poet in me has redeemed the bureaucrat in me had i not been a poet i would have been lost in the in the wilderness of bureaucracy a uh, sort of catapulted to power getting drunk with power and all that whereas as a poet with my human sensitivities i always found that the position that you are in gives a cons- gives you considerable leverage to touch human lives and i without being boastful about that i always i always have tried to be as friendly with people as accessible to people and address their uh, uh, problems to the extent possible in fact when i was in the secretariat for long years the popular joke used to be that uh, jay kumar's room you don't have to look at the board where there is a crowd in front of the room that is his room always people come to see me sir and i give him a, a patient give them a patient listening maybe the subject may not be my subject i mark it to the concerned secretary follow it a little bit so so sir wonderful things happen a little bit of care and concern bureaucracy can deliver it so i have always enjoyed being with people looking at their problems and trying to help and also listening to them that that nurtures my sensitivity in fact when i go into some railway station or airport and the public places at least uh, two or three people would come and meet me sir you may not remember me i was uh, such and such you helped me so i would say that did i really help you yes yes you helped me and i got it and this kind of thing sir is is what remains at the end of the day the human absolutely you should remember and you should not remember that is the point <laughs> yeah i don't remember but they should remember they should remember they remember many people come to me and say we had a lunch in new york with you i don't remember him at all but he remembers it <laughs> so here yeah, you know, very ordinary people very poor people very very people with uh, no no power or any any kind of thing the ordinary people they come and talk to me and sir being a poet being a lyric writer helped me tremendously because people Uh, all the bureaucracy is not nobody's darling a bureaucrat is nobody's darling people sort of distance themselves from bureaucrats uh, after all in malayalam it is always called adhigara dushprabhutva adhigara dushprabhutva so it is not prabhutva so bureaucrats are generally known for uh, their audacity or whatever their uh, arrogance and all that ivory tower our ivory tower nothing to do with common people hoy poloy but then as a lyric writer sir i write songs for films so they hum these so- so- songs so they know that i have written it so they sort of pursue a kind of freedom with me because after all i am the one who wrote a song which is to their liking which they sing most of the time so they come and ask me sir you are the one who wrote this yes so that immediately creates a rapport and that they are free to tell their problems and I'm feeling that you are also a human you become <laughs> human in their eyes <laughs> i become a human in their eyes so i have capitalized uh, that feeling and that has given me that is what i said the writer in me has salvaged uh, the bureaucrat in me without becoming a uh, sort of you know with no roots i always had been rooted because the poet in me that is the love to me in human <laughs> or arrogant but then as the vice chancellor of the malayalam university you have had a different experience and also an opportunity to get to know malayalam rich literature deeply and the application of it in modern day life how was that as a founder vice chancellor of the malayalam university so that was a very i could say a very chosen moment in my life five years uh, because kerala is full of uh, very great writers eminent people lit- literatures and all that many people could have been selected uh, as the vice, first vice chancellor of punjab university malayalam university but the then government for some reason thought that i am the right person to go and establish the university the combination of both uh, administrative experience plus literature and malayalam and all that so yeah. that was a I natural think, choice i thought i thought so but i never expected a post retirement job in fact the then chief minister asked me what are you going to do after retirement i said i have a lot of things to write i never got sufficient time so towards the end of my tenure as chief secretary he said uh, we have decided that you will be the first vice chancellor of malayalam university will you say no to it i said it is too tempting for me to say no <laughs> so i took <laughs> the job <laughs> because firstly uh, to create a university is a lifetime opportunity and uh, i could uh, build that opportunity create that university in my to my uh, to my 
definition of a university it's a kind of alternative university so it is not a run of the mill university it is no unlike unlike in other universities there are too many honors of malayalam literature you know i i met some of your some of your uh, faculty members and they were very opinionated they said you know who are you to tell us what we are doing in our university and no, that no, no, kind of approach i know i know i know what you mean i know what you mean i have i have uh, sort of endured it for 5 years but then sir i only recruited all these people but then in spite of all these opinionated uh, fellows around i could design that university in such a way that it it should stand out i don't know what is the position now the sense people who initially thought that it is going to be a university where you teach only malayalam literature or malayalam linguistics linguistics but uh, actually it is not like a university may uh, for example in israel uh, which will be teaching in hebrew uh, i thought that this is a university where everything will be taught in malayalam that is the way to enrich your language with scientific knowledge and academic knowledge people have a feeling that malayalam like sanskrit university where sanskrit is not taught <laughs> so. everything except sanskrit is not there uh, <laughs> yeah. so it's not their mistake because nobody goes to learn sanskrit that is the problem malayalam is a different uh, ball game so i introduced history i introduced sociology i introduced journalism film studies all kinds of things to be taught and learned in the medium of malayalam and initially some people thought that it's so difficult but as we went ahead we we knew that malayalam is a very pliant language it's a very rich language resilient language we were creating our own vocabulary and sir over a period of 10 to 15 years malayalam university would have developed that kind of a terminology vocabulary by which all kinds of academic subjects would be uh, sort of activated or uh, we could negotiate them in malayalam language. that is the way a language has to become rich that is the mandate of malayalam university and not, not, not only to... not only teaching you have to build an institution Absolutely. and also have activities which go beyond teaching you know uh, becoming a becoming a, a, a depository of knowledge in malayalam traditional knowledge sir uh, i would i would write like to say because malayalam university is still in my blood because i created from nothing i i created from nothing there was nothing so when i left we had uh, around uh, 75000 or 1 lakh uh, built in area and a good library around 35000 books and 10 courses phds uh, all the all kinds of things sir. and we had a studio we had a theater all these things i built when i say i i i, I appear like a baby or a child who has who says that i have done all these things but then i want to enjoy doing it what is important is we two projects or two three projects which we are which very which are very relevant one of course sir malayalam being a language in the indian union is one of the 25 languages so the central government will not do much to promote a particular language so it is up to the indian languages to promote themselves so i started a translation project i myself am a translator into malayalam sometimes into english but then i trans uh, started a project for translating and publishing it to very important publishers in english so that slowly it will be picked up by french publishers and german publishers and who knows uh, maybe in another 5 years or 10 years this one of these translations will go to the swedish academy and we might malayalam literature might get a nobel nobel prize right that was nobel prize you need a, you need a lot of translations for that absolutely sir and it has to be continuous it has to be complete continuous. works complete works of a person like that we have to do sir it has to be very planned and never it has to be very planned and never unfortunately there is nothing in kerala today so malayalam university started that project as expectedly as i after i left they had a sort of I want of the project saying that this is not a mandate not in the mandate of malayalam university i thought it is very much in the mandate of the university to glorify your language can yes. be in literature and i you know the frankfurt book fair sir promoting malayalam with a translation catalog i met at least 50 publishers they said okay we will keep on dialogue we will we'll have a dialogue the dialogue has to be kept this is one project i did the second project which is not materialize it is in the way to have a online english malayalam dictionary malayalam english english malayalam dictionary with audio audio how to produce the malayalam many people do not uh, uh, their accent is very bad so we thought that the new generation will access a malayalam dictionary only online so that is another project which we started then we had a publication project also where uh, books of uh, ancient books traditional books where a commercial publisher will not venture so these are the books which malayalam university should take out then we also established a chair gundert chair in tubingen university germany where uh, herman gundert had left all his uh, 
archival materials he collected from kerala very rare materials he is a real scholar sir he is a real scholar so the entire archive good at archives is now open to us we have a chair and we can do whatever we want we can translate we can bring out books edited volumes and all this that is going on etc so i thought in 5 years uh, uh, i should not write my own cr <laughs> but i say that they are all uh, fairly fairly impressive achievements which we could do in malayala university so i know that that speaks for itself there is no question about that but in terms of uh, employment how much opportunity has it opened up for our young people uh, sir that is one area where i did some work for example the journalism course that we were doing it turned out to be very popular so for example all the journalism courses conducted by these uh, uh, private institutions and press club press club and all that universities it's all in the medium of malayalam so you train somebody to work in a malayalam newspaper but the medium he is teaching he is learning is english we thought that why do you want to learn journalism in english you learn journalism in malayalam your malayalam also improves you are after all going to work in a malayalam media malayalam uh, medium of uh, in the sense uh, public media so that course is becoming very popular and malayalam manorama madhrabhumi all these people have taken our our boys and girls they are doing very well so our media course is very good our film course is very good and local administration course we have a course on local uh, local uh, development so all these panchayats are employing our people for consultancy work research work and uh, all kinds of things so there are opportunities great up but not conventional opportunities you have to find now, out now that uh, the official language is malayalam in kerala in files you are supposed to write malayalam that become to... also more important because many of us can't write on on the file in malayalam but what do you do for the ias officers who come from outside do you give them any training so, because they all speak but not the regular <laughs> not very well and not how are they going to deal with the files etc some of them may be there but uh, generally are they good sir uh, language institute is doing it the ind is offering this course through pravodayendra nair we have uh, we have developed a book also so we are serious about ind is doing it not malayalam university but ind has developed a module and even now we uh, give classes online 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 is better now. Yeah, they have the, whenever they have the time, they can. And then uh, officers will learn only if there is a compulsion. If all the files are in Malayalam, they will naturally pick up like they do in Canada. Canada guy, mm-hmm. everybody has to learn Canada because all files are. We are more pragmatic, sir. We, I think, even now, fifty percent of the files are still in English. English, <laughs> yes. But but we have we have people like Rishiraj Singh who can sing Malayalam songs. Yes, sir. <laughs> he does it out of love for it, and so that also is a. maybe an exception but you have those models also vinod rai speaks good malayalam amitabh khan speaks fairly good malayalam so there are officers who pick up it all depends on their uh, commitment and interest and um, coming to the universities in general and the new education policy they talk about multidisciplinary universities and not specialized universities so when that comes we will be in difficulty with some of the universities that we have created yeah. agriculture and so will malayalam university will also be affected by that will you have to introduce other courses malayalam university is a, is a is a university which fits into this this bill it's a sarvagala shala it is not a, a unidimensional university we teach humanities we teach now they teach even science also so it is a multidisciplinary university but your uh, engineering dul kalam uh, technical university medical university your um, uh, veterinary science university all these people uh, universities may have problem Because but what is your opinion about that which one is better sir i have a take on that because you cannot go for too much of a super speciality you cannot have a university for a super speciality subject there should be intermixing of disciplines and only you grow otherwise you grow inward inward super speciality in university is not very good because i think agriculture university was good enough where veterinary and uh, and fisheries were there now it is all I try for it. In a way, it is good for some time. They will grow, but they will not beyond a point. So this kind of convergence also may be good. But then, sir, sir, in the new education policy, there are a few suggestions which I have my own fears, my own apprehensions. For example, uh, universities are not going to be uh, affiliating universities. Yes. Affiliation to institutions are going away, and uh, institutions are going to be autonomy. Autonomy is the order of the day. Sir, autonomy is good if you are capable of being autonomous. <laughs> and autonomy for what? 
autonomy for improving your standards and the autonomy for deciding your curriculum to excel to excel then to from excel, the other to yeah. excel, but but i am afraid whether the autonomy that the new education policy would provide it might be an autonomy for anarchy sir. autonomy for uh, mediocrity because many colleges in many many states are uh, they, they are not even capable of they are not even we cannot even call them colleges they are just teaching <laughs> teaching factories or whatever so if autonomy is given to them it will be a door doorway to anarchy that's what i think no, but there are very many successful autonomous colleges also that that if you are moving your way in the sense so for, for example in trivandrum sir my, my alma mater my marivanis college that yes, i was also a teacher there yes so they are doing very well autonomy is a boon to them whereas autonomy with autonomy there are institutions which are deteriorate because they don't in teresa saint teresa for example they are doing excellent excellent right. happy to be there uh, the way they are uh, shape, shaping up so then that kind of excellence you cannot expect across the board so no, it increases the work of the teachers that is the main problem because they have to do much more work than what they normally do they are normally teach what they learned 30 years ago and then they don't want to change they don't want to move from there teacher has to be committed teacher has to be motivated teacher has to have lot of love for their children to be paid more because they do a lot of clerical work and various other things for which they are not compensated sir, that is also sir with all these constraints our centeresses and our marivanus or vimala college all these people are doing excellently well all these constraints yes. are, but at the same time when it comes to another college all these all the all these things become constraints yes i, I used to go to the newly become autonomous colleges to celebrate but one or two places i thought it was a it was a funeral it was so pulled down i was went there to celebrate and then they said no 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 this will not work here and uh, so at the same time there are other places where they were celebrating so is it the same state same people sir even with the university's uh, oversight some colleges are not doing well so with, with without that oversight i have uh, my own great apprehension so the only solace be uh, being that this is only a policy it is not a it is not a mandate of the government the government has not embarked on that let us hope that realism will prevail on the government while implementing the policy yes but um, on the school level perhaps there are qu- quite a few recommendations which may be practical as well as helpful don't you yes, think so yes, the yes, language yes. issue the kasturi mm. rangan's report is uh, good in parts in the sense it is okay when it deals with the school education but it is not okay when it comes to higher education school education for example there is a holistic vision at least you catch the children young instead of leaving them to this um, lkgs ukgs and all that where they are they are being taught unscientifically so if they could be integrated into the school system there is a scope for scope for uh, better uh, better standards in any case sir in the school sector governments have a much better say than in the higher education sector where the autonomy of the universities have prevented even government also from playing a very active role so now with the if the policy is implemented as such i think it will be anarchy in the higher education sector but in the school sector there are green shoots no doubt about it. there are green shoots no but there are some safeguards because this will always discussed in syndicates and senates and and so on so it cannot be a maybe it is not a uniform progress but there will be a beginning because we are thinking in terms of 30 years of time for these things to materialize that is right. because we cannot afford to just uh, stay where we are because we have to follow the best practices abroad also you don't have to reinvent the wheel the 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 affiliation has been abolished in most countries of the world we are the only ones who have affiliation the problem in so, india is the problem in india is its heterogeneity unlike a european country which is homogeneous in its educational background in its culture in its expectations in its lifestyle in its standard of living there is a there is a general homogeneity in a european country whereas india with its heterogeneity is not prepared for this kind of autonomy that's what i am saying so we have to apply autonomy selectively for selective application means you are again widening the uh, the, the, the the schism or, or the or the gap that is there so that is a paradox that is india sir you cannot have a one size fits for all for india that is a problem <laughs> that is where the, 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 the that is where it teaches and what is your opinion on foreign universities and private universities entering india 
because private universities everywhere except kerala but uh, foreign universities also they are thinking of bringing in so what do you think about it i i believe that it is the way to go but uh, many people don't agree with me we should not run away from private universities or uh, or foreign or, universities only thing is we should not allow ourselves to be washed away with the with the tidal wave we should have our own there is the whole mahatma gandhi theory leave your doors and windows open but don't get blown away <laughs> I mean, exactly exactly i am repeating mahatma gandhi sentiments we should not stay away from compete but then sir we should compete we should compete exactly. we, should, we should develop our own um, inner strength to compete with anybody we have the basic intelligence to compete with anybody in this world sir only thing is our systems are so weak we fall into mediocrity at the uh, drop of a hat no but we have examples of isro we have examples of universities here which are very good you go to manipal doesn't look like uh, kerala university it's an education city <laughs> yeah exactly sir we so, should shy away we should not shy away sir most of the time we are shying away from these things only for fear of some immediate adjustment problems somebody will be losing a job here somebody will be asking for a greater qualification somebody expectations will go up so people are un- they do not want to sort of uh, they are very complacent basically people have to be shaken out of their complacency i am not against competition not against competition but at the same time i am also a big votary for public institution where social equity has to be so the biggest argument against uh, private universities and even foreign universities is that even while it might guarantee quality it uh, sort of uh, there is a premium on money if it, uh, it, it sort of discourages or discriminates between people with economic background and people without it so that kind of social equity aspect if we can very intelligently and creatively overcome that divide i think that will be good for our people our students who are actually not much of their social even even social it's a point which the students also could get the benefit of this really higher education and come up so that's what yeah, but, but it is possible it is possible to design a private university with all the safeguards social intellectual proper problems reservation we did that we in fact submitted a model a private university built to the government but nobody even re- looked at it but it it the existing thing is the, those who afford leave leave kerala anyway those yeah. who have a lot of money will go to the us at least they will go to bangalore nobody will say my son will uh, go to college in kerala if it is the first priority first priority is always to go out it is those who cannot afford to go out who are go to go to our colleges so why not bring the mountain to mahamad that is my <laughs> my This suggestion but this fear has to be allayed sir kerala that this kind of social division will be accentuated or economic division will be uh, accentuated that fear has to be addressed first if that fear is addressed effectively i think kerala sir kerala is a very complex very complex and very practical society we fight against so many things but we are the biggest uh, promoters of global <laughs> globalization is it right that's a bit of hypocrisy there <laughs> yeah we are the biggest benefit is of liberalization but uh, we will oppose all these things because we have certain built in fears those fears have to be addressed so it's not like a question of how politically you manage it it's a question of yeah, it's pol- politicization in fact it's the opposite of that instead yeah. of politically managing it we in, in inject politics into everything including education that is really the politicization it has to be politically it's it's a question of political management It's a question of political management, or making it rather acceptable and highlight the benefits of this kind of opening up and, and the competition. I don't, I, today, what is happening is only the, 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 the negative aspects are being highlighted, and it is used as a tool to torpedo this. So it has to be politically managed. The political management is very important, sir, in Kerala to do anything. Without political management, I think the best of our intentions will be set. So I am very. That is how, sir. I survived in bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> no, one way to do it is once we have specialization, vocal, so, sorry, the uh, other specialized courses, etc., being introduced, like in the new system. Everybody won't go to a university. Everybody won't go to a college. That system we don't have. Everyone goes to a college, even if they become bus conductors at the end. It's a waste of time. but we are not able to make that choice at the age of 17 or 18 everybody goes for masters bsc and masters degree and phd and then they apply for uh, bus conductors jobs and so that 
consciousness. So you need to have a dignity of labor. You must have a better system of payment because the hardest working person gets the least payment in our system. So these are all the problems that we have. So we have to make some beginning somewhere. That is my plea anyway. Good. <laughs> now let us come to something more pleasant like your writings. You have been writing different genres, you know, poetry basically, but also novels, plays, and also translations and so on. So how do you choose this? Is it just a matter of inspiration, matter of experience, or you choose these systems for a particular theme or a particular idea? How does it work? Sir, it's like uh, when you go to a, on a holiday, you are chosen your holiday resort. So you are in that resort, you are basically you are staying there, but during daytime you will foray into so many places, you will explore a lot of lanes and by lanes in that resort, but you come back. Likewise, poetry is my home base, my base. From there I go into translation if something fascinates me. I translate from English to Malayalam, Malayalam to English. So it's all slightly impulsive also. Uh, I'm not a stickler to saying that I shall do only this. If something excites me, I do it. For example, Tagore has been my, my favorite poet right from my college days or even before. So I translated Tagore. Even now I'm translating Tagore. <laughs> uh, then Khalil Gibran fascinated me. And it's kind of this kind of spiritually oriented literature fascinates Rumi, me. Rumi. Rumi also is one of your favorites. Rumi, I'm still doing a biography on Rumi. So all these things fascinate me because it doesn't... Uh, coincide with the kind of poetry I write. This is my aspirational poetry. What Tagore writes is my aspirational poetry. I am not in my frame of mind to do, to write anything of that kind of brightness or that kind mysticism, of... Mysticism, mysticism, for example. Yeah, I, am, I, am, I am not up to that stage, but it is my aspirational poetry. So what I translate is my aspirational poetry. Then uh, recently, when I, when this lockdown started, I started writing a, a children's novel, a, a children's uh, literature. Uh, one novel which because it gave me a lot of uh, sort of what should I say buoyancy for my heart <laughs> because lockdown was a very depressing experience so I started writing a, a novel for a child, for children it is coming out tomorrow I am getting the copy of the book it is called Santa Claus so you, all your fantasies can run right then when uh, when we were in lockdown I thought that lockdown has robbed us all the charm of life because always you are at home you can't travel uh, <laughs> there is money in the bank but uh, as they say in Hindi, <laughs> no, you, you can't can. even use it. <laughs> uh, your car is in the garage, you can't take it. Nothing. You can't. So, what is the worth of all this? There are people with even more, far more comforts than we, we have, far more uh, wealth than we have, far more affluence than we have. Even they are also in the same boat as we are, uh, eating what your wife cooks for you a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in the afternoon. So, I was wondering, sir, at the end of the day, what is it that makes life worth, worth it? Is it the trappings of power? Is it the glamour? Uh, is it the social context you have? Ultimately, I came to the finding that it's not it. it is your sense of contentment. It's your sense of contentment that makes life livable. If you have everything and if you are not contented, life has been, uh, it has been lost. Like it is easy to say, where is the life we have lost in living? <laughs> That was the beginning. Where is the life we have lost in living? I think all of us are leading a very complex life. Complexity, externally induced to complexity, our own mentally induced to complexity, emotional complexity, all kinds of complexity, procedural complexity, financial complexity, relationship complexity. Why is it we are following into this trap? So I analyzed this and come up, and have come out to this book called the uh, Lelada Ji. Anyway, it's, uh, it's already come out, is it? It's a Madhu Bhumi publication, you said. Madhu Bhumi has got a book, sir. It is here on my table. So, day before yesterday, I got the copy, first copy of the book. So, this is the book. It is called okay. Lelita uh, Jeevitam. is my testament for uh, leading a simple life. I would like to pursue this, and I have signed an agreement with a publisher, publisher in English also to bring out an English version. So that these are slightly impulsive, I should say, not indisciplined, but impulsive in my concepts about writing. What fascinates me. But basically, sir, I am a poet. I publish around uh, this is my eighth uh, volume of books. Uh, anthology. Mm. 
and I published around three anthologies in English, forty-four books altogether. <laughs> but during the during the pandemic lockdown, did your productivity increase? I think so, sir. No distractions, no public functions. No, no but you have webinars. You have webinars every day. Like, yeah. <laughs> was relatively late with that. I think people discovered it only by June, July. <laughs> <laughs> but even webinar is okay, sir. It takes only one hour or one and a half hours. Whereas to give this one and a half hour talk, to travel. Yeah, exactly. I used to travel like mad all over the state, and sometimes even. Yes, for a half an hour speech, you spend three days. Three one day to travel, one day to. I went to Sharjah, Dubai, and Oman. For a Malayali Association function, then of course you also meet people. You also enjoy meeting people, talking to them. That is lost. In any case, no, that's what we miss most. I think uh, I hope it will be all back soon. Otherwise, life will be cut. Substitute <laughs> the joy of meeting people and seeing them, spending time with people. You, there is no substitute for that. Exactly. Diplomacy. Like diplomacy has been affected very badly. You know, you look at the General Assembly hall. There's nobody there. <laughs> so what kind of diplomacy is that? Online so, diplomacy is a contradiction in terms. Online diplomacy. Diplomacy. <laughs> because diplomacy is all 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 about touching your uh, your meeting, your smiling, your cracking a joke. And also, also without the hierarchical problem. That is what happens in the UN. The man sitting next to you may be the president of a country, and you can talk to him. As though he is your equal, and that is something I, which I, I experienced it when I went to UNESCO representing India right. uh, on this um, uh, in this convention on cultural diversity or something. I represented India, sir. I was Joint Secretary Culture. So right. the fellow sitting next to me was the Culture Minister of some country, yes. some Portuguese or something. So we are on one to one, one to one. Yeah, you are Mister. You are Mister. India. They don't yeah. want to pronounce your name, so. Yeah. <laughs> so they call it Indi, Indi, in yeah. Indi. So, yeah, that's right. That you I lose really your mean, identity, but it's a pleasure to speak for Rupa India Rupa and Rupa to be spoken to you as India. That's remarkable. Anyway, let us conclude it with some reflections on your lyrics. How are they doing? Yeah, are you adjusting your uh, emotions and uh, words according to the new requirements of the of the movie? Like, for example, this new movie called The Great Kitchen of India or something. I didn't those see songs, it. I don't think you can ever write those songs. <laughs> But, but they are very striking, very attractive, but you need a different kind of mind and different kind of training. And this is so a new trend. Isn't that a challenge? This is a new trend which came in um, after the after 2000, 1995 or so. People, this trend was there. It was started by Salil Chaudhary. When he came to do Malayalam music, uh, he did not do the language. So he gave a tune and uh, the lyrics writers wrote it. It was okay. Once in a while, you can do it. But then towards the end of 90s and early 2000s, this became a must. No music director would uh, set to a tune to your lyrics. They will give a tune. Basically because, sir, most of them are not as big stalwarts as the earlier music directors were. Now I am just coming back from a function celebrating Devarajan's uh, yeah. uh, album. So he was a musical wizard. He knew the raga so well. <laughs> so so he could, do, he could do wonders with any lyrics. He can do anything. Whereas new music directors are not that adept. Plus, there is a fashion. It's also a kind of trend, you know. Uh, so everybody would say, this is the trend. There are music directors who are very good with their music and uh, uh, the science of music. For example, Jay Chandra is a good the composer. He knows classical music. But then the trend is that you give a tune. Mostly because not to repeat themselves. So you can write to a tune, provided the tune has a classical base. But if the music director is trying to lift a tune from Arabic music, or, right. Spanish, or Latin, Latin music, or Latin American music. Then your language doesn't fit into that uh, that mold. Right. <laughs> your language doesn't break that way. It is not. It is in any case, sir. Malayalam is not a flexible language like Hindi or even Tamil. Tamil uh -huh. you can break anywhere. Hindi you can break anywhere. Malayalam is a classical. That way, it is in a classical mold. That is why old songs are still with us because there the tune and the words match. Whereas here. It is only the tune. We are trying to do justice to the tune to the extent possible. No literary value like Vailar and ONV and all that, you know, just their pure, pure poetry. Sir, when and you are writing to a tune, your only aspiration is that I have to fill, I have to get some words. Yeah. The tune. That is all. Whether they are coherent or not is none of my lookout. So, so as a result, sir, the songs are short-lived. They have a very short duration life, short shelf life. 
that is why even in uh, music and programs of flower, flowers tv and all that all the participants sing only old songs even young yeah. 10 year old <laughs> song of the 70s or 80s pilar songs of people ask it that is because that is what stays in your collective memory sir this i, I am a i am an acting lyricist even now i write for films i am very hopeful sir in another 2 to 3 years the trend this trend will go away because these music directors then simply realize that none of their compositions are going to stay they are all going to be short lived so there will be a need for more melodious music it will come out sir after all cinema is a very short film. it has a very short memory if i can do a film and i can have five songs all of them being super hits and this is it's a different trend so that will be the trend tomorrow in malayalam films so we have to make a film and put down the old mold old mold in a new style no but others are pleased me even in the old times using your poems actual poems not written for a movie are very rarely used you see one from shankara korup as a song or one from ayappa panikkar as a song but the classical literature poetry being used in the movies is very small numbers is that true that is true because sir, that is because classical poetry or conventional poetry is written to a particular meter uh, a particular vrtham as they say in malayalam so mm-hmm. a, a song a poetry poem written to a particular meter can have only a very limited range of musical possibilities so music right. director can create wonders out of that if you keep on giving them poetry so lyrics uh, is a different ball game its meter has to be different uh, so when you are writing a romantic song you cannot use a particular meter in the sense naturally it will come to you uh, a, a small <coughs> meter meter will come to you so that will fit into it but wherever they have used it it's very effective that's why i was surprised as to why and more and more the classical poetry is be not being used I'll tell you why I'll tell you why because it depends in what context it is being used so a group poem cannot be used for a very uh, very run of the mill context it has to be used in a particularly relevant and uh, deep context so such films are very few and far between <laughs> Mm. so using using classical novels etc also is that category isn't it people prefer something movie. cooked up for the movie rather than uh, or odile nenna for example but odile nenna was a great success in the 70s uh, we had at least so many films coming out based on your novels yeah. so many so many novels had come here I mean it's a classic thing uh, so many several novels had been made in the film now nobody thinks about making a film out of a novel because they want tailor made hooked up uh, situations very run of the mill kind of things so i think it will change and the new generation films are concentrated not very what should i say very extraordinary out of the ordinary very rare kinds of compositions and all the themes so i think these are all short lived experiments malayalam film will regain its poise but malayalam film industry has a resilience that also i should say sir because it goes after new themes new themes very boldly which a tamil film tamil film of course has its own experimentation but a canada film a hindi film may not venture into areas like what malayalam films have been doing so we have a resilience only thing is we become very shallow at times not at the mill so i think yeah, that is that is going down to the level of the people instead of raising their levels that is what we We want to ask him to buy with your uh, with your project on Kunchan Nambiar. What is your reading? You are going to write a novel on it, I believe. But Kunchan Nambiar as a film, I have my own limit doubts about uh, what kind of film it has. It will be. It has to be a very a, a film with a lot of depth because Kunchan Nambiar as a comic genius is the first rebel of a poet. Right. Poet rebellion, rebellion, sir. In the days where customs and caste. No, rebellion against the uh, chakyar only or generally in the society his rebellion against chakyar was nothing his naming his uh, uh, his water dullal as uh, as uh, cha cha dana sidangan dullal sidangan dullal parayan and otan dullal these are three castes in kerala sidangan is kulayan as we say normally and parayan is parayan and otan is ganagan the people who who does this uh, kind of uh, astrolo- astrology of the okay nadu they are the ganagan so these are he both three castes names were used by kunchan nambiar 
to say that this is my art form this is sheerang and tulle this is parayan tulle and in those days there were considered as in the front in, in the margin so in naming his art form he showed his rebellion saying that art art doesn't recognize this caste barrier namibia has not been appreciated or evaluated as that kind of a revolutionary as as a kind of avant garde in those days so his rebellion against chakir was nothing because he had been planning he had been planning so my uh, my research on uh, on namibia has exposed the namibia before me who is a far more likable and adorable character than uh, generally people think about as a comic fellow he cracks jokes no no jokes is a facade he is cracking joke at the fallacious ideas about society so i have done lot of research but i come for not i might even attempt a novel on kujan nambiar so this is my sort of fascination as i said i jump from one place to another if something fascinates me i don't believe in the story that he went off to sleep Well, I, I don't believe because sir, a, a performing artist considers the stage as very sacred. He touches the tarad or tattoo on the chest and the area. So every mm. artist touches and uh, pays the place he to the stage. Arangi. And uh, and he's so clean as a initial bath and he's so clean in outside and inside. And then only he touches and does the uh, his percussion. So to imagine. Uh, A hundred percent artist, accomplished, accomplished artist like Mujit Nambiar to fall asleep on a, such a high-sounding viava, on an instrument like viava, is unreasonable. He would not fall asleep. He would have preferred to have fallen asleep to deliver a message to Nambiar, saying that you are so boring that I can't. That is for. And also, he was preparing all this from before. He could not have created all this one night, don't you think? All the things overnight. Yeah. He must have made so. I, I always, while writing the script, I thought that whole night he must have thought, how do I, how do I hold this show? What is my costume? What is my headgear? What is the talam? Uh, who is going to do it? What is the? But that is possible, humanly possible to do it in one night. No, no. He must have thought about it, sir. Over the days, he must have thought about this rebel. But I was waiting. He must have been waiting for an opportunity. Hmm. He must have written a chapter to ridicule him and rebuke him so that he could go out and. And stage a rebel drum. So yeah, exactly. We should, go, we should go deep into his psyche. So whether the film materializes or not, my honeymoon with Kapoor had been a very, very rewarding experience for me. I could find a rebellious poet whom I shall adore, <laughs> not only for his humorous uh, statements but for the depth of his character. That is what I might write. And sir, who knows? Worldly wisdom, worldly wisdom. That is almost like Jana Pana. No, so. Oh, <laughs> Very good. In one line, he says, "Dairitre men thanna arin thanna arinya varke pari paraklesha vivega bolu." That particular word, paraklesha vivega, to know the other man. Dairitre men thanna. If you don't know what hunger is, how are you going to? Know yeah. the other man's hunger. Pari paraklesha vivega bolu. So when you read uh, this, Mani Pravalam, Sri Krishna Jari the Mani Pravalam. Like they say about Hamlet, somebody read Hamlet and said that this book is full of quotations. Yeah, <laughs> it's a like, book of quotations. <laughs> if you if you read the uh, uh, Sri Krishna Jari the Mani Pravala, most of our casual uh, observations and uh, our commonplace traces in Malayalam, it has all come from him. Aras Karatin Guru Pali Vital Kala Andre Kaitu Shamit Padumdo. All all there, sir. Ambiar has given us so many of such. Yeah, such utterances which have gone into the uh, almost uh, almost aphorisms like bacon right, right. <laughs> well very good thank you very much for doing this twice okay. not not once spending your valuable time but i hope it will be of great value to our viewers last time itself there was so much of excitement about this program and that was why i was very happy when you uh, agreed to do that again so thank you very much for your time mm-hmm. and the and the enlightenment that you have provided thank you very much thank you very much thank you